Rave to the Grave. Hi, this is Vivian Host, and you're listening to Rave to the Grave, a podcast where we take partying very seriously. Today on the show, I'm so thrilled to welcome house music queen Barbara Tucker. A true diva, Barbara has given voice to some of the most famous and uplifting house hits ever. Tracks like I Get Lifted, Most Precious Love, Stay Together, Beautiful People, and 1993's Deep Inside, perhaps one of the most sampled house songs of all time. Barbara has been honing her craft since the late 1980s. She has nine number one Billboard hits and has worked with Masters at Work, Blaze, DJ Pierre, and David Guetta releasing on iconic house labels like Strictly Rhythm, Defected, and Positiva. And beyond her amazing diva vocals, this New York native is also a seasoned house dancer and choreographer, a party promoter, and a teacher and mentor. Despite all this, I still feel like she often gets left out of house music history, and I really wanted to sit down and hear her story. Welcome to Rave to the Grave. Barbara, thank you for being on the show. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I actually have always wanted to interview you. Having heard all your vocals throughout the years, I wanted to find out a little bit more about the foundations of your sound and about your life in music. And I don't normally start interviews at the very beginning, but I understand that you have somewhat of a musical family. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I do. Not extensive, though. You know, my mother, the late Elsa Blake, who was also a minister, um, she and her sisters grew up singing as a trio. But my dad became not just a singer, but a recording artist with the group called the Persuasions. They're the grandfathers of a cappella, um, and they were honored not only by New York City through Mayor David Dinkins, but also through Spike Lee. They were they're noted as the grandfathers of a cappella. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and um, born downtown Brooklyn, but later um, for some years we lived in Coney Island. Um, my mother, um, we lived on the top floor. My aunt and her children lived on the bottom. But then later on, as my mother went for her um, marriage, she we moved back downtown, the Fort Greene section of Brooklyn, and I've been here pretty much all my life. Now, music, I didn't think of myself any different than any other child. You sang, you danced, you act, you, you were playing um, Coco Livio, one, two, three, one, two, three, Skelly, um, Relay Race. I was more active than I was singing, meaning I did them both, but I liked I was more physical. I like to play and I like to play hard. I like to play tag. I like to play, 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 play. Again, with singing, because my grandfather, my grandmother, they ran a church at the same time. We, that's something that we just always done. All the children, the grandkids, grandmother always taught us a song. We were singing every Sunday or something growing up, just singing. Um, I, again, love music, but I didn't think it was any greater than any other child. I never was at a young age with a brush in my hand saying, I want to be a star and I want to sing. Um, actually, I wanted to be um, a stewardess or a gym teacher. That's what I saw myself being as I was like in the seventh grade, eighth, ninth, um, you know, like that in that way. Um, again, music, very soulful. Um, not a lot of music in the house, though. Interesting. Um, we, we did watch Soul Train, like all the, the kids in the neighborhood, but I can't say my mom was blasting music. You know, she was busy going to school, getting her master's and my stepfather was an architect and he was busy doing his thing. So it's interesting for music, even if you didn't grow up with it, if it's your assignment from the most high, from God, it's going to be pressed out in you in one way or the other, it's going to get you. As I um, became a teenager, 
to stay off the streets. My mother enrolled me in musical theater at the Billy Holiday Theater in Brooklyn, where there I was actually the only one who was singing, dancing, and acting because those things came naturally to me as well. And I wasn't a shy child, so I guess that was it. So I did um, study a little after a while at the Billy Holiday Theater, whether singing, acting, or dancing, I was that artist. So at what point did you get asked to sing on a record or did you get asked to record something professionally? Yes. Well, um, I had friends, again, as we're growing up in music, and they're like, come on and do background. I'm doing this song. And you just would go and sing because people, your, your people recognize what you can do. I just didn't take it serious. But it didn't start really get, getting serious, I want to say, um, because I've done some background stuff, but I didn't take that serious. But in 1984, I was at um, a club in, in Brooklyn called the Ozone Layer, where David Morales was the uh, resident DJ. Actually, it was his party. And I was dancing, and someone recognized me and said, I, I have a group called Promotional Straight. I'd love for you to come dance with it. You can sing, or you could sing too. Yeah, I could sing. And so that was the beginning because that same label, Just Born Records, and God rest the soul of both of the, the label owners, the next year they took the background girls and they created a group called the Holoriquian Four. And that was December 85 was my recording on that level that I was able to do. Y'all want this party started right, and y'all want this party started quickly. Set it off, I say, yes, y'all. And that's the beginning of the recording of Barbara Tucker. So what was the first ever club or underground party that you found yourself in, and at what age were you in there? Because you were going to a club before you recording. I was a, a late bloomer. I want to say about 21, I started going to clubs and it was the, um, the ozone layer. Wait, no, I was going to Club Serene, which is down on Flatbush Extension and 4th, uh, uh, not 4th, it could be 3rd. It was around the YWCA, but I do know one thing. It is no longer here. It was turned into a pawn shop later and now closed. So Club Serene, some neighborhood spots that I would go to. But my the heart of my partying was at the Ozone Layer on Flatbush Avenue um, with David Morales because I was with a dance troupe called Internal Combustion. And we used to rehearse in the club. And then after we rehearsed the dance troupe, we would stay on Friday night said party. David Morales, I mean, now one of the, you know, legendary house music DJs, but was he already playing house music back then or was it still kind of electro funk or freestyle or what was the well, kind of Well, it never was template? electro, even though to me, the definition of electro or electronic is if you can plug it in, it's electronic, but they didn't call it that. It's interesting because someone asked me this question last week. What was the first house or how did I, how, how was it? I was telling them one minute we're dancing to Janet. So in love with you. So in love. Next thing it's house. Like it was such a smooth transition. Um, David Morales would play R and B dance. Let no man put us under. You know things like that. And then next thing you don't know. Oh, 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 you're in house. You're in the house world because we're not the DJs. We can't specifically say. On December 25th, right. such and such, this started house music. We were the ones who danced to it. So all we know is as dancers and as a dancer in a dance troupe, we went from it grooving to um, a house, house grooving, from R&B dance grooving to house grooving. And the thing about house back then is very soulful. But then as the years went on and as other cultures got involved, they sped up the beat, but still kept the four to the floor. So this is happening in my life around 85, like I said, about 85. But we know house was there before that. Um, and again, it just depends on the club because you could have been going to an R&B dance club and they might not have played house music, but when you're going to places like the Paradise Garage, making that transition 
was a natural or Tony Humphrey's parties, a natural transition or Brooklyn with um, David Morales. It was a natural transition from that R&B dance, disco-y type feeling, which is the mother of it, into the house, the R&B, the soulful house. I'm glad you mentioned the dance aspect. I've seen a couple of videos of you um, housing <laughs> on the on the internet, on the YouTubes. Um, and I think a lot of people who uh, maybe are getting into house music, whatever that means to them at this moment, don't really know about the house dancing culture that is so tied in to the music and such a part mm-hmm. of when you're talking about clubs like The Loft or The Paradise yes. Garage or that yes. kind of foundational era of New York house music in particular. I'd like to say this. I wasn't a club head. I did go out to party, and we had such parties that were just as good as The Loft because our DJs, like a David Morales, was influenced by that Um, the loft. So I didn't really have to go. I have gone to the garage. I even performed at the garage doing background for two, two different artists. Um, so, um, when I was heavily into the house, the house, um, community, we would go to the tunnel. Remember the tunnel off the West side highway and the culture of house. I love because they were not dusty. Many people, what I mean by that, you know, people now they really come with, you know, a T-shirt and washcloth, Um, like at the tunnel, you couldn't wear sneakers, you couldn't wear a T-shirt, you couldn't like, um, you couldn't dress a certain way. Like other clubs, they allowed you to do that at the loft because those people were really coming to work out. But the tunnel, they didn't mind you getting soaked and wet, but you could not look raggedy. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm not saying anybody else was looking raggedy. I'm saying there you could not look raggedy. They because we're in the scene uh, in the we're in the era of somebody's picking you at the door. But the music was slamming, you know, um, that I'm, I'm trying to even remember the DJ's name. I know he was Latino. He was Latin. Um, and the music was awesome. The dancers always looked good and sexy and fresh and smooth with their own style. And even house had a look back then. I remember when people were wearing a lot of polka dot type things. The guys were wearing big jackets with with ties and they had the high top fades and, the you know, the twisties. So they had a lot of flavor back then um, in house music, which I appreciated. And I would come with my long coats on and my Air Force hat and my jeans with my thigh boots, uh, um, just party and just dancing. I was one in that time of me being a club head. Um, I would um, always dance in some form of pumps. I can't dance in sneakers. Later on, like if I went to the shelter parties, I would have either granny boots on or combat boots, but never really sneakers. I never really partied in sneakers. Um, I like combat boots. Um, as well as granny type boots, because I was I was one of those femme femme um, club head. Yeah, I love that you talk about that because that's so much of like club land in general is the fashions and the different kinds of people that will flock to a particular night yes. spot or gather or follow certain DJs, especially back in like the eighties yes. and nineties. Yes. Yeah, you see how they were back there. Remember that whole um, Peter Gation club, Nightlot, the club kids, and they were bigger than life with their colorful costume. Those are, that's, I mean, me and my partner, Don Welch, we used to throw a party at the um, the tunnel also around that that time. Ours was a, just a bit more housey, soulful, but Peter Gation's parties, they were very lively. I remember when house was very, lively. It, this is before techno came out, but I just want to say it was very lively with the costumes. Nell is really just really basic. The kids don't even have a clue today of what house was or dance. It just wasn't the music. It was the whole culture from your clothing to um, the, the artists. Oh, it was, I had a ball. I had a ball. <laughs> So I'm glad you mentioned uh, the costumes because I was reading this interview that you did a, a long while back now with uh, Frank from DJ History, and you were saying that you really believe as an artist that people should dress up and 
put on something different and kind of put on a show and be in a character themselves. So I was wondering, wh- what is the Barbara Tucker character or characters that you embody? Okay, so first of all, what I'm, I mean, so that other artists who might be listening, you should not have the same outfit on as somebody in the crowd. If you're going to be an artist, express every creative thing that's of you. There's a difference between a singer and an artist. A singer is a is a um, American Idol person. I'm there. I'm singing the song. It's just there. Artist is your prince. Artist is um, your Cindy Lauper. Just the, the style, your makeup, what your hair doing. When I really came out hard. Um, I came out always wearing an Afro wig. That was my signature when I came out in 85 because it was the soul. I felt the soul of house. And then I felt I want the people in the back row to see me. So let me find the biggest Afro that I can find. And I'm inspired because remember, I come out of the theater. So I not necessarily was sewing my outfits, but I was designing and putting my outfits together. I had a friend named Ronald Frankel who was helping me because he was a sewer, but I would design my outfits because I think that when you're on stage, the costume, just bring it to life. Let's have some fun with it. Um, Because if you are five singers and you're all singing the same song, what is going to separate you from the one who just sang the song? If all your voices are good, you have to come with the, with some, a fantasy, a character. So mine was always the Afro thing. And I love being femme. I love the tutu type things. I've, I've sewed, I put tutus together with just a pack of safety pins of the, the bigness, the color, the, the, the variations of it. So I really like costumes. I come out the theater. So that's what you're going to get nine times out of 10 um, from the wigs to the jackets to the coats. But when I'm home on my own and I'm just chilling, this is me. I like my turbans. I like big earrings, you know. So, but I think it's um, really important that artists let the fullness of the artist come forth through them. Back to um, the Harlequin Four in 1985, you record this song. What happens in your career after that point? Because at some point you go from kind of singing background and being part of these groups to becoming the diva, the icon we know as Barbara Tucker. Again, I'm still not sure that, quote, this is what I want to do. I'm a part of a group because I'm at that age that, first of all, my court, the dance, my dance mentor became our choreographer. So now to me, it's just like a show. Let's do a show. But it's interesting because December 85 at the Fun House, we performed and guess who was the DJ? Little Louis Vega. Who would have thought years later that we would have um, been working on beautiful people or my partner, Don Welch, would have hired him to be our resident DJ um, at the for the Underground Network. So I'm, I'm all over the place, but I'm still doing music because whether you're singing it, dancing it, choreographing it, styling it, or you're in the theater of it, you're still a part of that. So the next thing that I did was work with Tommy Musto. And um, I guess I started, things just started coming. When beautiful people starts the deep inside, that's when it just goes straight nonstop from then to, from then to now. Prior to that, I was either dancing with someone, I was doing background singer singing, I went on tour with Delight, and Bootsy Collins, uh, the Groove is in the Heart tour. We did the Japanese and the European tour. So I'm working with artists. I'm doing studio works, um, choreographing for artists. I choreographed for like Michael Wofford, Joe Vaughn, Jay William, Sweet Sable. I did a, me and my partner at that time, Jana Saunders, who was AKA in the Matrix. We choreographed the show for Shannon. So we were busy still in music, but doing other parts of the music industry, as well as me being a promoter in the nightlife and promoting artists. That's why I think they were calling me the queen, not because, oh, she got a hundred number one billboard hits. No, because I was all over the place having my hand in whether it's promoting it, whether it's um, writing for it, doing background with it, choreographing it. I was having a ball. I was all over the place. And prior to 
92, still didn't know that this is what I'm going to do because each day I took it one day at a time. You know, we did with, with Sally Summers, we did me and Willie Ninja, Archie Barnett, and um, what's his name? I see um, Bravo Laporte. Um, we were recognized as underground house dancers. And so if you go to the Library of Congress, now in the library, we are the faces of that that movement that is now considered a form of dance. One day, one of my, I was out with Mass Order and some of the dancers doing their video and my party was still going on with Don Welch, my partner of the Underground Network, and he hired Louis Vega. And as the party ended and he was exiting, I was coming in the doors and one of my workers, Shanawa, said, this is my other boss, Barbara Tucker. She also is a singer. And Louis said, oh, this is good. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Okay. And that was really short talk. When we went to the Sound Factory bar um, in this, this is 92, around 92, when we went to the Sound Factory bar, then instead of what we were doing was having a different house DJ every Wednesday, we asked DJs to be our resident the, they, were, they were not in agreement with what we were offering at that time. And then we got to Louis Vega and he was okay with the fee. And that was 93. We're, we're moving up. And then he says, I have this song. I have this song. My wife, um, India wrote with Lim Springsteen. Oh no. Before that, he had me come on over. He called me, come on over. And I'm busy ad living on a track. And he said, perfect. Good. And the next thing I know, he has this song that they wrote and it was beautiful people. Now the deep inside, that's my ad lib. Those are, you know, I'm a, I call no Tommy muscle called me an ad lib queen. Like I just go on and on and on and on. As long as the track is going, I'm just going to keep singing. Cause you didn't tell me to stop. <laughs> Okay, so initially they are the writers of the track, and then I came in with the third verse, and then of course, deep inside all we need is all of that stuff. <laughs> I'm really glad you brought that up because I think one thing that um, that I'm always telling people who are starting out, you know, DJing or even in this culture, is you know, there's nothing wrong with taking different opportunities and being involved in all this different stuff. You know, if you're really in love with this culture, whether it be house music, culture, whatever music you're into, if you're in love with the culture, you just want to create new ways to be involved in it, whether that's promoting a party, whether that's dancing, you know, all of these running a record label. And of course, you have this beautiful voice, but your name was on people's lips because you were actually... They were seeing you all the time. They were seeing you at the yes. club. Like you can't really be a DJ or an artist in this scene if you don't go out and meet the other people. If you're not a part of the scene in a genuine you're way. Right. You are so right. You have to be in it. And again, these are the part. These are the, why people call they uh, call you the queen. I didn't even look at myself as that, but people were calling me that because they would call me, what's the party happening tonight? You have to be a part of it. You yourself, not you just a body, but you wholeheartedly get involved with your, your scene, get to know people. Who are the labels that are putting out these records? Even the background singers, who are the singers? Get to know people in the industry. And they, like I no people. We were doing the new music seminar, and I remember we did a party, and I had 19 artists on that bill. We were at the Manhattan Center, and it was so crazy that I forgot that I was singing, you know, and because I'm hosting and I'm busy doing this behind the scene. But I thrive on stuff like that. Get to know your community. I mean, that's another crazy thing, too. You know, it, it's very it's a lot of work to be the one promoting the party and throwing the party, but also sometimes performing at that party as well. <laughs> one thing I, I respected about the Underground Network on Wednesday night, 
we called it industry night because all the house labels would come out there to hang out, present their new music and showcase their new artists. Or sometimes the label, if they had more than um, one artist, two artists, they can even have five artists. It could be a label. We could present their label party night and let all their artists perform and let their songs be played. That was the vision of Don Welch. And I just held on tight with that vision. And it just really, really worked because it helped introduce a lot of DJs and artists to the industry and to the scene that if you were of house, that's where you wanted to be on a Wednesday night, either DJing or performing. And it was such, such a family, such a family. So what club was that at? What year are we? It was talking under, about? Underground Network. We started in '92 at the Club Elite. It used to be formerly the Savage, but then after that, we moved to the Sound Factory Bar, where Frankie Knuckles had Friday night, and um, Charles Jackson, I believe, had Sunday night. Danny Tanelli, I th- did he have? Not Danny Kravitz, I, I might have had Saturday, but we had Wednesday. Wednesday night, it was all about Wednesday night. And we were doing that party actually from at that spot, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, for about six years there. But then the two owners broke up. So then it was like trying to find a shoe that fit. And either clubs were too big for us or they were too small for us. But house, unlike techno and other parties, and this was a Wednesday night. House wasn't massive in New York, but it was a cult, a big, thick cult following in that way. Our party wasn't a druggy party because we attracted dancers, real like dancers. They took what they did serious. They got their workout on. They tried new movements. So the dancers knew to come there. So we didn't have a druggy party. So a lot of times, how, how can I say this? It seemed like the it seemed like the bigger the parties were, the more of that that was there. But then you you had you had excitement, but you didn't have that those dancers. Our dancers were just bad that would hang out. I remember when Janet Jackson came to the club. I remember when MC Light came. I would remember when Brian McKnight. I remember various people because they knew our party was happening and they could find dancers there. And it was just all that. So um, we really enjoyed it. I remember in 92, we had a dance contest. That contest was all, like, that's what we do. We would have dance contests. Um, we would have, um, okay, it's Thanksgiving. So me and the owner is making a turkey. People, all the staff are bringing dishes. See, that's a black thing. That's what we do. We got a party. Who's bringing the food? That's all we want to do, bring the food. <laughs> so it's Easter. Okay, we need to get somebody here and get a choir on the stage. Look, a choir at a house party. This is me. <laughs> oh, so such and such coming out. Oh, well, she's on Broadway, but she has a house tracker. Okay, we're going to bring her here. So this is what we would do. And this is what was lacking in the latter years of house in New York City to me, because it started just going to this, the Afro thing. You weren't seeing any artists. People were not really supporting artists, but I love and I miss the Underground Network because we supported everybody. You know, it just was changing in the last couple of years. Um, And we stopped our party. We would do now only specialty parties. And then I was getting busier and busier, traveling, touring, um, living in Ibiza for 19 years. And this is my first year in 19 years not being in Ibiza. It was really, really weird for me, almost depressing because I'm like, what do I do? I'm here in the summer. What is anybody doing? Are we in our house? Are we out? What are we doing? And so I started getting really getting more closer to working with my church um, and just doing what I got to do. You know, we're all surviving. But my priority now is making sure my relationship with God, the source is tight. God, let me um, serve at the church. Maybe I could pray for somebody. So I'm do I do that first. That's my priority. Make sure that God, I'm a vessel here. How can I help assist or whatever I need to do? And then comes my, me breathing and working on my career or my family. Everything else really comes second. That's what I'm saying. 
I'm glad you brought up uh, spirituality and faith because I wanted to ask you about that in connection with house music. You know, all the famous house music tracks that we think of, Joe Smooth, Promised Land, yes. um, Beautiful People, of course. Uh, just like there's so many hits in the early days of house music that are spiritual, that are, you know, uplifting. It. And I feel like it's interesting because what house music means now, it's such a big umbrella term. So people who are getting into it may be like, you know, in Ibiza listening to Martin Garrix or David Guetta or whoever they're listening to, like that music for me seems very disconnected from that thing. Of course it is. Let's look at cherry Kool-Aid. You have Kool-Aid and the more water you put in it, the more it gets diluted and you you lose the, uh, the authenticity of it, of the taste of it, but yet you can still see pink in it. It's no longer red, but now it's kind of pink because the water has diluted it. And that is now the, the interpretation of that DJ of their house so much that they have to create another name for it. But definitely it started off as a spiritual thing. And I want to say about like 90% of house artists back then come from the church or they were still in church. So their lyrics were a reflection of hope and peace. And that's what they sang about. You know, remember R&B, R&B stands for the rhythm and the blues, whereas house was about hope. House is about hope. And as um, and because it started in the black community, um, that's what whether it be of the civil rights time or whatever time, we're always writing songs that that try to that, that bring us to hope, that help us to get out of a consciousness of 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 incre empowerment or or something that's why our lyrics are the way they are now if you tap into other cultures to do house they might not experience that though they're singing along with the song but then their writers come along and they start writing from their experiences or their cultures but pretty much the basis of house is hope is love is spiritual is unity so I like to say it didn't give you a church experience as much as it just brought up that warmness of love. And I think when people think of church, they think of love because you start smiling at your neighbor, dancing and singing the song. And then it starts talking to your consciousness of, well, maybe we all can get together or maybe we all can be beautiful people, or maybe there is a promised land and I'm singing about it. There's, so I'm going to start believing. So people start to believe in the lyrics that are telling the story of a better day. What would you say are some of your favorite experiences that you've had in the studio with different people? Like what comes to mind when I, when I ask that? Being in a studio with little Lewis and we did Funny How You Love, and I'm thinking, did I ever meet him? I don't even think I met him recording that song. Or you hear his voice, a very soothing, mesmerizing voice. I went into the studio. There was a mic stand. There was the mic stand lamp. The lyrics were already printed out. Funny how you love. And he would talk smoothly and direct me through the song. And it set such an atmosphere of a calmness. When I record, I'm almost there right now. Um, so that was a very unique session right there. I remember when I was in the studio and I recorded with George Clinton and Bootsy Collin and some of the crew for a Herbie Hancock project. And they were smoking their weed, you know, the brothers, they do what they do. And I was talking like this. I couldn't hardly talk. And he said, what's, what's wrong? Is the smoke bothering you? I said, yeah, I, I, you know, I couldn't really sing or talk. And he said, well, you know, we'll put it out because this is your session too. And I thought that was so cool. They called me Little Miss Funk, Little Miss Funk, because I guess uh, me being like five, three, five, four among all these big guys and the, what was coming out of my mouth, he called me Little Miss Funk. And I was honored with that you know, working with him. But I had some good, I remember even working with David Guetta. I was with my management at that time. I'm downstairs writing to songs. And this is on his first album, um, Just a Little More Love. Um, 
I'm downstairs writing and my management is upstairs working out contract. <laughs> so the, the, the synergy, the excitement of doing this because I was in town doing a gig. And then um, the agent, Mateus Kalamba, who said, you know, David Guetta wants to work with you. He's a producer. He is. I don't know. You know, this is he was not big then. Right. At this point, his wife owned the restaurant. He owned the club, but he was a DJ also and an up and coming producer. And so he, blah, 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 they're going to, to do a song with you. They want to do, come on. I said, okay, then I, you know, I'll do it. We had the contract. So they're busy up in the office with the, um, his publishing company and they're working that out. And I'm downstairs writing songs. Uh, um, give me something you gotta give me doing whatever. So that was a very interesting time in the studio. But one of my greatest time is my opportunity to pr produce a project with the Weekend Hill House Choir that I put together. It's like um, anywhere from 20 to 30 house artists that could be a part at any given time. And I could be in the studio teaching them songs, going over songs, whether it be with Michelle Weeks being a part of the project, Don Tolman, Kenny Bobian, um, Karen Anderson, Karen Bernard, um, Charlotte Small, Melanie Daniels, who did background with Kim Burrell and was um, Mariah Carey's vocal. She always demoed up Mariah's vocals. And it's just, oh my goodness, so many projects working when I'm able to bring a multitude of house artists together for projects to, like we did the last project for the, it's the Weekend Hill House Choir and the song was Live, Dream, Hope, Love. And this song um, is not out yet, but it was produced to raise money and awareness for the Book Bank Foundation. And the Book Bank Foundation is a foundation I'm a part of that helps bring books, clothing, toiletries, empowerment to homeless people. So that's really important to me to wake that up in artists that you can't just sing and sing at a club. What are you giving back to humanity? How do we make a difference with what we do with our talents here? So I think a lot of artists are in this position, singers especially, uh, vocalists. They get their final chance, their big break. They get to go into the studio. What advice would you offer somebody that is just getting to go in the studio for the first time and work with producers and, you know, work in a professional recording studio and just, like, take it out of the house? Yes. Be prepared. Don't come looking like you're trying to pick somebody up, a producer up. You want to keep it all business. You want to make sure you vocalize. Make sure when I say be prepared, your vocals are on point. Don't come there. If you know you've been smoking, you've been hanging out all night, you're drinking. Trust God. Uh, I would say if you feel you, this is a gifting and a talent given from the most high, take care of it. Always like I always pray before I do a session. So I say, God, cancel me out and let you arise. Let the expression come through. Let people be blessed by this. Let this song come forth, God, so that someone will be touched, moved, or inspired by what we're going to do. And just, um, just relax. Breathe in, relax. And when you sing or write, think of other people. Don't just think of you and... Um, I would just say, I, I, I almost have to stop there because I don't really do R&B because I don't sing rhythm. I don't sing the blues. My thing, my whole thing is about singing empowerment, lifting songs. Um, if I was to write an R&B, there would be an answer. I sing and I don't just stay, keep people in the problem and the sadness of something. I'm going to flip that and I'm going to take them into a solution of it, how to be better for yourself or how to get the power, find the power, be the power. So again, um, I always start off with my prayer. I make sure before I get to the studio, I vocalize. I am presentable. I wear relaxed clothes. I'm not trying to go out on a date and I'm not trying to do anything unseemly with producers because it's a business. You want to keep that line of professionalism going because God forbid you go and cross that line. Next thing something happened and you can't you you can't even have a real another business working relationship because there's drama, you know. Know what you're there for. Don't mess it up. Know what you're there for. It's, it's the, if you were assigned this, let the creations 
come forth. Let the creation, the songs be birthed out of you. Yeah, yeah, that's where I think from. That's where I come from. But be professional and have fun. Have fun. You know, just have fun. And when you're doing it with a heart for the people, because you want the people to be blessed by it, not, oh, because I've got to be bigger than um, Mariah or J-Lo or Janet or somebody. When you go with that mindset already, you, you're just knocking yourself out the box. Don't do it to compete with somebody. Do it to, to better a people or to better. It's a, your messenger. Lyricists are messengers. And that's what I have to say. Well, amen to that. I should also mention (laughs) on this note that if you're not familiar with the Barbara Tucker discography, one of your greatest songs is called I Get Lifted. And uh, that's like, I feel like that's a Barbara Tucker signature. Um, Do you remember anything? I Get Lifted, yes. Yeah, amen. All right, can you sing it a little bit more for the people that don't? Okay. I get lifted, I get lifted, I get lifted every time when the music's on my mind. I get lifted, I get lifted, I get lifted every time, leaving all my cares behind. Oh, I get lifted, yes, I get lifted, oh, I get lifted, yes, I get lifted. And we know with that song also, written by myself, um, Ron Carroll and um, Big Ed, um, Kanye West used the O and the yes out of that. And of course, Kanye West also used the deep inside from beautiful people. Deep inside, deep, deep down inside, oh, we need love. Yeah, I mean, I think that was so great. And it is so great how these songs keep getting a new life as they get sampled, as different generations use them in different ways. Like, I feel like the Kanye thing, you know, not like, for instance, Deep Inside is this enduring song. I mean, I've been listening to it, I feel like, my whole life by now. But, you know, it's it always gets brought back. And like, Which song is that? uh, Deep Inside. Oh, deep inside. Yes, it's a, you know, people have even tried, you know, singing it in some of their songs. And that's my signature because when I was in the studio singing it and how it, the, it really went, it, it's a part that I was singing and I was like, red and black and yellow, gray. you know, I was going through the um, colors, the different cultures of people, um, deep inside uh, in our house, the, the, uh, something, all we need is love, red and black, uh, the, you know, something like that. But pretty much it came out of that, of my vision of, I don't care who you are, red, black, yellow, who, all we need is love because deep inside all we need yeah that's it This music has so many ups and downs. I mean, all music does. Music changes a lot. The business changes, the technology changes. Like you're up one minute, you're down the next minute. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time where you considered quitting house music or quitting singing? And if so, what did you do (laughs) to to keep going? I I never felt that um, because I was always doing something whether it be with my church. Um, again, I was in I- Ibiza. I was the first, I was the one over there with a resident. There were times I had four residencies in one season on the same island. So um, George Morell once said, never always keep coming until they're finished with you. And as long as they keep saying, come on, Barbara, we got gigs and keep on going. Um, Maurizio Clemente, another agent, said to me once, he said, many house artists, they may have a, they get a song out and they're able to promote it for the three months. But with you, you'll go three months and then, because it wasn't so much about the song as much as when people see you, you have a show and they, your presence. And I think you have to be authentic. You have to show yourself friendly 
and you have to be professional. I don't get high. So when I'm performing, I'm able to communicate with people, with the owners, and I treat everybody as there's somebody. I don't go in with, oh, I'm Barbara Tucker and where's my this and this and acting all that other way. I just want to have fun and I want people when they hear me and when I'm in their presence, I take them away from whatever drama they might feel and take them to a feel good place. And that's what it is. Um, I work with artists, again, producing. I've written for this um, artist called Mitch Matlock. We have a track getting ready to drop, Chanel. And just, you know, Susu Bobby and I've written for just writing for artists and helping other artists. And I think that's it. I think with me is because I put God first. When you put God first, then he brings you forward in the things that you do because you're not greedy and you're not like, I got to work, I got to work doors open. So, um, right now, obviously this is a challenging time for everyone. Um, but we trust God and we find the other creative gifts within ourselves to help us create because we don't know what's going to happen. Is the club's going to come back? Is this going to come back or what have you? We don't know. And you can't sit and wait for it. You have to be about something. Um, that you can do, maybe take some courses, maybe grow another part of your creativity and another aspect to be um, there in a human way for other people or something. But no, there wasn't a time to say, I'm, I'm giving up on this because I realized at one point that it was an assignment for me to do this. Well, I have a couple more quick questions for you. You know, from afar, listening to all of these house hits from the 90s, you know, this time of Strictly Rhythm Records, Nervous Records, in New York City, in Eight kind ball of... ball records. <laughs> in kind of, I guess, the I would say the mid-90s to, to up to 2000 just seemed so explosive, you know, living on another coast and watching everybody come out of there and all these big records. What are some of your favorite memories of that era? Wow. Um... A lot of touring was happening, especially around that time. Stop playing with my mind. Stop wasting my time. That came out around that time. One of my favorite songs, first of all, is um, Daje. Ooh, oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Uh, Brighter Days. She's one of my favorite artists because I like to see her perform mainly. <laughs> um Pretty much clubs definitely going through transitions and we're still trying to hold things together. Um, in New York, that was my vision of what I'm remembering of clubs transitioning as music is speeding up just a little bit more and cultures are trying to find themselves. And of course, raves are hitting. And then um, are we, is it this type of music and the soulful is hanging on with a thread? We're not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. So the transitions of the music, the need, new DJs are, are, are pumping up and we're just going where the music has taken us, still traveling this is a year, you said up until the 2000s, this is a year be before 9-11 hit. Um, so pretty much making some big decisions and um, I'm touring with the record. I was, wasn't home that much because I was touring a lot. We stopped playing with my mind overseas a lot. Thank God for the communities and the labels that were overseas because they're the ones that really helped us, help house artists really make it because in New York or USA house was sub was not something that ruled It's hip hop and R and B ruled and the pop culture. So house was doing what it was doing, but not on such a major label. If you were doing a dance tune and if you were kind of on the commercial, um, like, a, I think we're alone now. There doesn't seem to be anyone around. You can hear it in a club with maybe a house mix, even though it had, um, co how do you say, commercial um, hit success. So you're in the middle of where do I fit? Like, I was like, where do I fit? Because I wasn't underground, but I wasn't that type of commercial. But then by the, with my songs, when I went overseas from Beautiful to, to I to jazz it up working with Eric Murillo, God rest his soul, to stop playing with my mind. I was a pop artist in the UK with that. So house is really interesting. 
Nightlife will come back eventually. Club culture will come back eventually. It might not look the same. What are you hoping for when things come back? That I'll have my space outfit on when it does. Let me start. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of outfit I'm going to have? Do I need an outfit with a mask on? Do I need to have the turban connected to the mask? <laughs> you look, you got to make light of it. Sometimes I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine because I just feel, you know, people are playing games with people's lives out here and it's not right. So I don't know. Clubs are the last thing that government is thinking about. I remember when Tony Toon was trying to do um, a protest and, and meetings for Save the Nightlife in New York City and nobody was budging with it. And um, this was years ago. I remember we did a fundraiser for that. And because he was on the board, the nightlife board and they were thinking about closing this club. That's when they went to, that's the year they wanted to close the tunnel and they eventually did and so on because they wanted to build real estate buildings. They wanted to build buildings, not have clubs. So I don't know how it's going to be in New York. Um, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine because this is a scene that people weren't, they weren't fighting for it anyway. So I'm like, then you know what? It's going to fall. And then what they're going to do? We're not going to have a scene because while they think they're dancing, somebody's in a board meeting talking about, we don't care. We're going to buy this club and we're going to turn it into an office building. We're going to turn it into um, condominiums and stuff. And sure enough, that's what was happening. So again, I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm taking it one day at a time. And music will not go away, but in terms of the buildings or or those type of things, I don't know. We'll see how it's going to play out. All right. Well, next time there's one, I'll see you there, right? Just to let people know what we're talking about, there's a party, outdoor party in New York called Soul Summit. It's a house music oh, it's party yearly. Um, that happens in Fort Green Park. And uh, they play, you know, kind of this classic New York house music that we've been talking about. Very uplifting. It's free. Um, you can see multiple generations of people into the culture, into the dancing, et cetera, there. And that's what I think is really special about it is that you see that, you know, sometimes um, growing up in this, you're like, people are telling you, oh, you're going to grow out of this. You're going to grow out of wanting to go to a club. Mm. You're going to grow out of being an artist or being a DJ or whatever it is. And it's like, like no, you're not, actually. You probably won't. You might, but you won't. During the summer, remember they were every week? Yeah, that was crazy. The party? But then politics got involved. Other people started moving into the community and didn't want it. And that's how the numbers got chopped down because the person, and I won't even say their name, but they wanted to run for a certain office. So they had to do what a certain culture asked them to do because it attracted so many um, black people coming to the park and Latinos and so on. So everything, again, gets political at the end of the day, I remember in the summer, it was like every week, every, pretty much every week. Yeah. And then it went down to maybe three times during the summer or twice during the summer, I think. Yeah. The gentrification problem is real. Ah, uh, well, yep. I'm surprised that people move to New York or live in New York if they don't like amplified music and people partying in the streets because I think any that's, city in any I mean, city because that's what city life is about right it's all the way live <laughs> indeed <laughs> I mean yeah move to the suburbs if you want everything the same and you want it quiet or move to the woods so my final question is you know there's a lot of people getting into house music every day and like we discussed house music is this really broad umbrella term at this point but what mm. would you like people to know who maybe are new to this music or new to dance music in general? What would you like people to know about the real culture around house music? What I feel, um, because I, I might have a different idea than someone else, but what I feel about house music, and it is a spiritual thing when you let your expression go freely, um, you don't have to be on a substance to be free, but house music, when you're hearing the instruments, the four to the floor or the live instrument, when you hear that diva, because there's always a diva, usually on a, 
yeah, we're reaching, reaching. And when you have messages that are going into your soul and you start resonating and connecting, house music connects you to the heartbeat of the earth, of the world, of the globe, of what's happening. You know, um, when you have an India um, singing love and happiness, we just want love and happiness. That everybody, who doesn't want love and happiness? Who doesn't want brighter days? Who doesn't want to be, you're free to do what you want to do. Just live your life. Well, you know, who doesn't want these things? So the artists are tapping it, writing songs that are talking to the soul of people. Because I know they want it. I know we can all be beautiful people. We help one another. No one's better than the other. Let's go and move this together. Because in the sight of God, we're all equal. We don't have to to, um, hate one another and be prejudiced or judging one another. Let's, you know, you're different. I hear you. That means you're unique. I I celebrate you. You know, the house is, you're going to be free. Because house music will awaken and shake up your spirit to be free. It will transform you that you will come back. And it's like, wow, I've been dancing this long, (laughs) singing this song where a place where everybody's just singing. Could you imagine how houses like you go there and everybody's singing a song or singing the parts that they know, like some genres of music is just so music, you know, and everybody's doing what they're doing. It's tapping into a different um, vibration, but house music, you are a part of the creating of the vibration because when we're all singing together, we create the vibration. So house music is home. House music is you, the vibration. House music is a culture. House music is ageless. You can sing it and be 80 years old. If you got a good beat and those lyrics are kicking, they will welcome you. They will not ridicule you. That's why I love house because it's ageless and it's colorless. Thank you. So beautiful. Well, we got to end it here. What more can we say? That was gorgeous. Barbara Tucker, thank you so much for joining me here on this podcast. My pleasure anytime. Thank you for thinking of me at this time. Anytime. God bless you all. Keep you all powerful and lifted. Rave to the Grave is recorded at the historic Newsstand Studios at Rockefeller Center in New York City. The show is hosted and produced by me, Vivian Host. Our engineer is superstar Joe Hazen. Our theme song is by Star Eyes. All additional music you hear in this episode is by Barbara Tucker, Blaze, and Hard Drive. You can listen to Rave to the Grave on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on this and other episodes, check us out on the web at ravetothegrave.org or follow us on Instagram at ravetothe.grave. Until next time, permission to party.